Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be terminal unit troubleshooting. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. Later I'll be joined by David Pick and Weber Wu for questions and answers. David is our director of HVAC technology and comes to Titus with over 17 years as a consulting engineer. Weber is our terminal unit product manager. You may submit your questions at any time and we will answer them for the benefit of all at the conclusion of our program. In today's webcast, we'll look at some of the more common terminal unit problems that people encounter. More importantly, we'll look at strategies for preventing field issues from ever occurring. Terminal units present special challenges to many air conditioning service technicians. Their training usually covers rooftop units, furnaces, and condensers. They're also very familiar with seven-day programmable thermostats. Unfortunately, terminal units involve specialized controls in order to provide pressure independent sequences to cover a wide range of very specific applications. Even if service personnel are lucky enough to have gotten some training in terminal units, it's difficult to master the wide range of control systems offered by control contractors and terminal unit manufacturers. There are so many possible topics to cover that this could easily fill two webinars. Perhaps we'll do another installment next year. In this segment, we'll look at dampers, fans, electrical issues, and electric coils. Perhaps next time we can look at controls, installation, and other topics. Most terminal units use dampers to regulate primary airflow, so we need to talk about dampers. The two common types of dampers found in terminal units are round or rectangular. Rectangular dampers can be single blade or multi blade. Multi blade dampers are sometimes built with opposed blades. They are all suitable for use on terminal units, but round dampers have the advantage of lower cost, lower leakage, and simplicity. Multi blade dampers tend to have higher cost, higher leakage, and more moving parts. Some people tout the linear response of the opposed blade damper as a control advantage, but that really hasn't been true since pneumatic controls were largely replaced by digital controls. So what can go wrong with a damper? It's certainly not rocket science, but things can still go wrong. A lot of problems can be avoided by manufacturers shipping units out with the dampers full open. This allows air motion through the system before the controls are in operation. It also prevents possible unauthorized personnel from climbing up to the boxes to readjust or force the dampers open. This often involves loosening the set screws on the damper actuator, turning the damper shaft with pliers, and then locking the screws back down. Everything's fine until the control contractor finds that some or all the dampers have been tampered with, necessitating a visit to each unit by his startup technicians to verify the damper orientation and properly torque down the set screws. It might not seem like a big deal, but when hundreds or even thousands of units are involved, this can be a major problem. It can all be easily prevented by shipping units out with dampers open whenever possible. Another issue involves faulty diagnosis of control issues involving dampers. Field personnel during the commissioning of a new building may decide to test all of the dampers in the system. So they go to the thermostat and turn it all the way down expecting to see the damper drive full open. Then they turn the thermostat all the way up expecting to see the damper drive fully closed. If they don't see these two things happen, they start reporting problems and putting them on a punch list. This demonstrates a lack of knowledge regarding pressure independent VAV controls. Remember, most HVAC technicians get very little training when it comes to terminal units. The controllers typically found on terminal units are pressure independent and are designed to regulate airflow between preset minimum and maximum limits. Therefore, a damper is unlikely to ever go fully open or fully closed. This isn't a problem, it's simply the controller doing exactly what it was designed to do. On a related note, sometimes startup technicians report that all of the dampers on a job site are full open and won't close regardless of the thermostat settings. My first response is to ask whether the air handler is running. If the air handler is off, VAV controllers will tend to drive full open because neither the minimum nor the maximum airflow limit is being met. Again, this is just the controller doing exactly what it was designed to do. By the way, this is a good thing about pressure independent controls. 
They sit full open all night long waiting for the air handler to resume operation in the morning. That's much better than driving closed, in which case the air handler might have trouble starting due to high pressure, or if it does manage to start, it could actually damage the ductwork. Now let's look at motors. There are two types of motors used in terminal units, PSC and ECM. These motors have different operating limitations and features, so they should be selected and applied differently. Permanent split capacitor motors, or PSCs, for many years were the only motor choice. These motors can be single speed or multi-speed. They can be unidirectional or bidirectional. They use a silicon controlled rectifier, or SCR speed control, to balance the fan. They typically have sleeve bearings for low cost and quiet operation. These motors are classified as high efficiency motors, but only when compared to shaded pole motors. The efficiency is 20 to 40 percent and is directly proportional to the speed. So as the speed is reduced, the efficiency is also reduced. When properly selected and installed, PSC motors can expect to have a service life of 10 to 12 years. Failure usually occurs due to sleeve bearing wear. SCR stands for Silicon Controlled Rectifier. These are commonly used as dimmer switches for lighting control, but SCRs can also be used to slow down AC motors. Everybody knows what a nice smooth AC sine wave looks like. It's also known as a pure sine wave. Well, SCRs reduce the usable power supplied to the motor by chopping and distorting the area beneath the AC sine wave. The result is known as a modified sine wave. Now this isn't an ideal situation, but it's a very cost effective solution and it works okay for trimming the speed of a motor. I've heard motor manufacturers disparagingly refer to SCRs as wave choppers. You can see why. Most SCRs come preset for a maximum allowable turndown in a range of 40 to 50 percent of full voltage. Major turndowns are not recommended, so fan selection is critical to avoid field problems. More on that later. Electronically commutated motors, or ECMs, have gained wide industry acceptance for several good reasons. These are programmable motors that are designed to save energy and provide extended service life, among other features. These motors include an internal rectifier that converts AC power to DC power, with an internal control that pulses DC power to the windings. They can be programmed to provide constant volume, constant speed, or constant torque. Most manufacturers program for constant volume, so the motor can automatically correct for external pressure changes. For instance, an ECM drawing air through a filter will automatically increase its speed as the filter loads up. It will continue to speed up until it runs out of torque or sucks the filter in. More about that later. These motors require the precision of ball bearings, so unlike the PSC motor, they don't really have a low speed limitation. The motor speed is controlled by a pulse width modulated input signal. Of course, the biggest advantage of the ECM is its ultra high efficiency. Depending on who you talk to, these motors are said to be 70 to 80 percent efficient over their entire operating range. That means that they could be 10 to 60 percent more efficient than a PSC motor. Add to this a projected service life of 20 to 30 years and you can see why ECMs are rapidly replacing PSC motors for terminal unit applications. As stated previously, ECMs accept a pulse width modulated or PWM speed control signal. This allows the motor speed to be adjusted within a pre-programmed operating range. Most manufacturers provide a choice between a speed control with a manual adjustment dial or a speed control that accepts a 0 to 10 volt DC input signal. This is sometimes referred to as a remote PWM and it allows the motor speed to be ramped up or down through a digital VAV controller. This allows for dynamic fan sequencing where the VAV controller can command the fan to change speeds based on load requirements, occupancy, or the season. The ability to adjust the fan speed without accessing the unit also simplifies the balancing process. Fan power terminals bring a host of problems associated with motors and blowers, so we've got quite a bit of ground to cover. 
The first thing involves blower packing. Anytime you have a direct drive motor turning a blower with its output shaft in a horizontal orientation, it's a good idea to pack the motor and blower for protection during shipping. In this type of application, the blower wheel is cantilevered on the motor shaft and can cause bearing damage if allowed to move during shipping. For this reason, wedges and rings of corrugated cardboard are usually inserted to prevent movement. The installing contractor should see warning labels on the outside of the unit indicating that this packing material must be removed prior to starting the units. If the packing isn't removed, the result can be burned out motors and or unbalanced blowers. It should be noted that motors with motor shafts pointing vertical, that's up or down, uh, generally do not need any sort of packing. Another problem involves oiling. Put away those oil cans. At one time, motor manufacturers provided oiling ports and oiling tubes and recommended periodic oiling of their motors. About 25 years ago, they eliminated the oiling tubes, capped the oiling ports, and no longer recommended oiling. All terminal unit motors used today are permanently lubricated and therefore should require no oiling. The problem with motor oiling was that it either didn't get done at all, or the wrong oil was used, or too much oil was used. To get away from all of these problems, all of the leading motor manufacturers went to permanently lubricated designs. I still get inquiries from building owners about oiling schedules, but none of the terminal unit motors still in service today should ever need oiling. Low speed operation of PSC motors can create several problems. The sleeve bearings found in PSC motors can be expected to last 10 to 12 years when properly applied. The most common PSC motors have a maximum speed of 1,075 RPM. Problems start to occur whenever motor speeds get below 600 RPM. At speeds below 600 RPM, the sleeve bearings may not have uh, a complete lubrication film, and uh, the result in, this results in accelerated wear and reduced service life. In addition, since these are air over motors, running at lower speeds increases the operating temperature of the motor. This combination of reduced lubrication and high operating temperature could drop the motor life from 10 to 12 years down to months or even weeks. On top of this, the more you reduce the speed of a PSC motor with an SCR speed control, the louder they tend to hum. This low frequency motor hum tends to go right through ceiling tiles, so it can become a major issue for tenants. Manufacturers' fan curves provide minimum and maximum recommended air flows versus discharge static pressure. The minimum curve is typically the 600 RPM curve. The best way to avoid PSC motor problems is to stay away from the minimum fan curve. And here's another thing to think about. Selections are typically made at a discharge pressure of 0.25 inches of water. Actual field conditions are often much lower. If you were to select at 0.25 inches on the minimum curve, the actual conditions could easily result in motor speeds less than 600 RPM. So keep this in mind whenever you're looking at fan curves. For PSC motors, I like to select towards the maximum curve, not the minimum curve. Our next issue involves motors running backwards. Some PSC motors can be wired to run clockwise or counterclockwise. These are called bi-directional motors. Other PSC motors are built to run in only one direction. Then there are ECMs that can be programmed to run in either direction. So assuming that the right motor's been installed and it's been wired or programmed correctly, what could cause a motor to run backwards? Well, the problem usually occurs in series fan units, especially when using ECMs. If the air handler starts before the fan units are commanded on, primary air can quickly flood into the fan cabinet, putting it under a slightly positive pressure. The blower wheel will then tend to freewheel backwards. When the fan unit is then commanded on, the motor is likely to continue to run backwards. When this occurs, it still moves air to the room, but at about 50% of its normal capacity. Obviously, the best way to prevent this sort of problem is to operate the building such that the series fan units are switched on before the air handlers. 
In situations where the air handlers may be serving other areas while the units on the same air handler are not operating, simply drive the primary dampers on these units fully closed before giving the start command. Since we're on the topic of fan power terminals, let's look at another item often found on these units, namely induced air filters. Are filters required or recommended on fan power terminal units? That's a good question. Filters are recommended if the units may be operating during construction for temporary heating or ventilation. Optional filters should protect the motor and blower from dust contamination. Construction can generate a lot of dust, especially drywall dust. Dust tends to deposit unevenly on blower wheels, causing imbalance. Dust or lint on the outside of a permanently lubricated fan motor can actually provide a migration path and wick the lubrication from the bearings. So optional filters provide a cost-effective way to protect the motor and blower assembly during construction. But what about after construction? During the balancing and commissioning process, these construction filters are typically discarded and not replaced. Unlike air handlers and other equipment that require regular attention from building staff and service personnel, terminal units are not located in closets or equipment rooms. Terminal units are therefore ideally designed for zero maintenance because they're typically located above finished ceilings and occupied spaces and can therefore be difficult to access. Replacing filters is costly, time-consuming, and disruptive to tenants. Frequent access to terminal units can also easily result in damage to furnishings and ceiling tiles. For this reason, most fan-powered terminal units are operated without filters. But what if I want filters? Some building owners and engineers will always insist on filters, believing rightly or wrongly that they protect equipment and improve indoor air quality. If that's the case, I still wouldn't recommend putting filters on the units. Instead, I'd recommend installing filter grills in the ceiling. This provides easier access and allows the use of standard filter sizes for economy. What about MERV rated filters? MERV rated filters are available on a special order basis for most manufacturers. I can assure you that most induction ports on fan powered terminals were not sized with MERV rated filters in mind. So be aware that MERV rated filters can therefore be expected to reduce the maximum airflow on most fan power terminals, unless specifically noted by the manufacturer. Now let's talk about filter problems. Obviously, if filters are used and are not changed frequently enough, they'll get dirty. As filters load up, they are likely to cause a series fan powered unit with a PSC motor to exhibit fan shift. This is said to occur when the return air path of the fan is out of balance with the primary air path. When this occurs, the total air supplied to the zone begins to drop off as the primary damper closes. ECMs can often correct for this automatically, but PSC motors can't. Also, the added pressure drop across the dirty filter makes the fan work harder, resulting in added operating cost. One common filter problem involves filters blowing off of series fan powered units. Service techs and balancers often believe that it's caused by a fan that's running backwards, and it may be, but not for the reason they are thinking. Forward curved blower wheels still move air to the room even when they're running backwards, but at 50% of their forward capacity. So in a series fan powered application, a backwards fan won't blow a filter off a unit but excess primary air will follow the path of least resistance and dump out of the induction port. This is why the filter keeps falling off. The same thing happens when a series unit hasn't been properly balanced. If the fan airflow isn't greater than or equal to the maximum primary airflow, primary air will escape through the induction port. That's what knocks the filter off. Then there's the problem of filters being sucked into fan powered units. This can occur as filters become dirty or if highly restrictive filters have been installed. I recently spoke with a building owner who installed MERV 13 filters and had this very problem. Although the engineer who designed the project specified MERV 7 filters after construction, the building owner found MERV 13 filters in stock from a local supplier, so he figured he was getting better filters. Well, he was, but the ECMs on the units in question were strong enough to suck these filters in. 
Most terminal units include either electronic controls, fan motors, and or electric coils, so electrical issues can arise. The first thing to know is that the National Electric Code, or NEC, sets the minimum requirements for electrical systems and buildings. Many cities and counties have additional local requirements that must also be met. And of course, everything is open to interpretation by local code officials. NEC requires that contractors shall only install UL or ETL listed appliances in buildings. UL writes the safety standards for electrical products. The products can then be listed by either UL or ETL. The listing covers everything from a product's design to approved components, manufacture, and quality control testing. Representatives of these listing agencies make random visits to every approved manufacturing location in order to verify that all the listing requirements are being observed. Any modifications involving electrical characteristics that occur after leaving the manufacturing location can void the listing. It's therefore essential that products are specified and ordered with the correct voltage, phase, and kilowatt prior to shipment. If changes do occur, a field inspection by qualified UL or ETL personnel may be required in order to receive approval. UL requires that all products include electrical data labels. These labels instruct the installing contractor with regard to the size and type of electrical service that must be provided. The labels must include the supply voltage and the phase and full load current draw along with circuit sizing information. The minimum circuit ampacity, or MCA, indicates the minimum allowable current rating of all supply circuit components, and the maximum overcurrent protection, or MOP, indicates the largest allowable external fuse or circuit breaker to be used. While all electrical appliances require some form of external overcurrent protection, it's best practice to follow local code requirements. For products that draw 15 amps or less, UL requires manufacturers to mark the labels with an MOP equal to 15 amps. This raises some questions with contractors because 15 amp breakers are rarely found in commercial buildings these days. Generally, the smallest circuit breakers are rated for 20 amps. The good news is that there's an NEC exception for products that draw less than 600 amps allowing the circuit breaker to be increased to the next standard size. So a 15 amp product can be installed on a 20 amp breaker. Just for reference, the standard breaker sizes are 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and 60. For the purposes of terminal units, the largest breaker you should ever see is 60 amps. This is because most manufacturers don't offer terminal units with a steady state current draw in excess of 48 amps. Going over 48 amps requires subdivided circuitry and other design changes. When taking starting inrush into account, a 48 amp product can easily result in an MOP rating of 60 amps. Speaking of fusing and protection, many specifications call for primary and or secondary fusing on all control voltage transformers. This is probably a requirement that's no longer necessary. For many years, UL standards have required that all control voltage transformers be UL Class II type. These are known as inherently current-limited transformers. They basically have a weak spot in the windings that acts as a fuse in the event of a short circuit. Basically, the transformer pops instantly if you short out the secondary wires. Although these transformers are easily destroyed, the addition of external fusing is generally not recommended. Since it's unlikely that external fuses could pop quick enough to save the transformer, it could just mean additional fuses to replace in addition to the transformer. I should also mention that control transformers very rarely fail due to overcurrent. A transformer rated for 50 VA doesn't fail because somebody connected a 60 VA load to it. No, these transformers usually fail due to faulty control wiring that results in a dead short on the secondary wires. Sometimes these problems involve ground loops through various control components. And you've got to watch out for service technicians who like to use the so-called spark test to check whether a transformer is working. This involves momentarily touching the secondary wires together to see if it makes a spark. If it does, it's very likely the transformer will won't be any good after this test. 
it's the quickest way to turn a perfectly good transformer into a perfectly bad transformer. Now let's look at electric coils. Before we go into electric coils, I must say a few words about safety. I got a phone call once from a guy in the field who was looking inside a heater control box for the very first time. He said he was standing on a ladder holding a voltmeter that he had borrowed from somebody. He was asking me, you know, how do I turn on the voltmeter and where do I touch the probes? I told him to listen very closely. First you need to close the control box door and twist the handle. Then come down off the ladder and find a qualified technician to look at this heater. There was no way I was going to be responsible for a guy who had no business putting his hands inside a live electrical enclosure. As someone who's done field service, I know exactly how it feels to get shocked and fall off a ladder or to have a screwdriver blown out of my hand. The job site is the right place to practice electrical safety, not learn about it. Assuming that you're qualified to poke around inside an electric coil, you'll need a digital multimeter. You'll want to read the incoming voltage to make sure it matches the data label on the heater. Once you know the voltage and you want to verify the total kilowatts of the units, you'll need a clamp-on current tester. Set the thermostat or override the controller for full heat. For single phase heaters, the total kilowatts are equal to the voltage times the amps divided by a thousand. For three phase heaters, total kilowatts are done the exact same way except you, you divide that answer by 1.73 which happens to be the square root of 3. Then you check to see if this matches the data label on the unit. If it doesn't, you likely have an element that has failed or a stage that's not being energized. This is by far the easiest way to test heaters in the field. Don't waste time looking at temperature rise because airflow and temperature are far less accurate than a few simple electrical readings. With electrical readings, you always know exactly how much heat a coil is producing. Most problems involving electric coils are related to excessive leaving air temperatures. Although UL safety standards limit electric duct heaters to a maximum leaving air temperature of 120 degrees, no one should be selecting heaters for such high temperatures. In fact, if you tried to deliver 120 degree air, you'd likely have intermittent operation because most heaters are required to include 115 degree auto reset high limits. We shouldn't be trying to deliver the hottest possible air to the space anyway. We should be trying to provide optimal thermal comfort for the occupants. According to ASHRAE standards, we shouldn't heat from the ceiling with discharge air temperatures more than 15 degrees above the desired room temperature. This is recommended in order to limit temperature stratification in the space and to improve ventilation effectiveness. So if we limit our leaving air temperatures to 90 degrees, we should improve comfort and avoid overheating problems with electric coils. Most overheating problems are caused by insufficient airflow. There's a simple equation that describes air temperature. The delta T is equal to the kilowatts times 3160 divided by the CFM. If we assume 55 degree entering air and a maximum desired leaving air temperature of 90 degrees, that's a delta T of 35 degrees. If we rearrange and solve the equation, we would see that we need at least 90 CFM per kilowatt. That's a good rule of thumb for single duct terminals with electric heaters. Fan powered terminals require more CFM per kilowatt because the mixed air entering the heater will be warmer, so a lower delta T will be necessary. Building owners who have allowed heaters to be used before the building has been fully balanced are often surprised to find out that some heaters are permanently damaged. They wonder how this could happen. After all, aren't the high limit switches in the heater supposed to prevent heater damage? The short answer is no. The high limits are safety switches. They are designed for human safety, not heater safety. But what about the airflow switch? Shouldn't the airflow switch prevent operation below the minimum recommended CFM? Again, the answer is no. Airflow switches are only intended to lock out the heater in a total absence of airflow as when a fan shuts down or a damper goes completely closed. Airflow switches operate on total pressure. 
That's any combination of velocity and static pressure at the sensing point. There is therefore no way a simple pressure switch can read velocity. It's also worth pointing out that the standard switches used by heater manufacturers have a fixed switching point, so they're not even adjustable. There is no way that any manufacturer can prevent damage to heaters using the UL prescribed safety devices. To make this happen, other controls that monitor inlet velocity and or the discharge uh, temperature would need to be provided. Hopefully we've covered all that we meant to cover. Just remember that terminal unit dampers don't always go full travel. And don't select PSE motors to run at low speed. Always turn on your series fan boxes before you turn on your air handlers. If return air filtering is deemed necessary, use filter grills for easy access. Also avoid high discharge temperatures on electric oils and never operate them until the system has been balanced to ensure proper airflow. That concludes our program today. We thank you for spending this time with us and hope that this material will benefit you in your professional endeavors. We will continue to produce more programs covering other HVAC topics and hope that you'll join us. Our panel will now begin answering questions that came in during the program. If you have any questions, please enter them in the box on the right side of your screen. Thank you and have a great day.